We thank you for our blessed Lord Jesus. We thank you for he's the author and perfecter of our faith, the captain of our salvation. We thank you for such glorious example that he has set before us. We thank you that he's mighty in battle and there is none that can withstand his words. There's none that can withstand his power. We reverence you, precious Lord. Thank you for the presence of your spirit with us this morning. Thank you for honoring us with the same. Thank you for the fullness of joy in your presence. Thank you for the rest in your presence. Thank you for... You watch over your word to perform it in our lives. Just as rain falls from the heavens and do not return and snow falls from the heaven, so is every word that proceeds forth from your mouth. It accomplishes the purpose for which it is sent. The words that you send to us, they will accomplish the purpose for which they are sent. And they will cause every one of us to be perfected. They will cause every one of us to be edified. They will cause every one of us to be fully clothed in righteousness. We give you praise, precious Father, for such glorious purpose that you have for our lives. We honor you, precious Father. Thank you for the privilege of fellowship with you, with your Son, and with your Spirit, and with one another. We give you honor and we give you glory. Have your way in our service today in the name of Jesus. May the work and power of your Spirit be unhindered in the name of Jesus. Let your precious words be honored and glorified in the lives of every one of us. We give you praise, precious Father. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Thanksgiving service today. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the name of the Lord. Thank you so much, Charisma. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, this morning at the worker service, I began with uh, a song. And I think I still want to be, begin with that song. Is Toby still around? Where is Toby? She's gone in. Okay, praise the Lord. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful. Oh, wonderful love. So high. You can get over it so deep. You can get under it so wide. You can get around it, oh wonderful love. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful. God's love. Is so wonderful, oh wonderful love. So high, you can get over it so deep. You can get under it so wide. You can get around it, oh wonderful love. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, congratulations to our women. I saw Sister Timmy, you are enjoying life. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. And uh, we pray for you that, um, like Sarah, you continue to grow in a meek and a quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of the Lord. Amen. That was a good one. Well done. I want to encourage every woman to please join the Women's Fellowship. And at the same time, every man, please join the men's fellowship as well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Great things are in the offing. Amen. Great things are in the offing. Well done and more of such in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I'm starting out today with um, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 3. Um, the book of Hebrews chapter 8, uh, the chapter is actually talking about Jesus as our high priest. And so in verse 3, it says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. 
Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one to have something to offer. Now, this was actually talking about Jesus as our high priest. And sometimes when we hear the word high priest, we tend to get a bit um, uh, hazy in what it means. Well, high priest is simply chief priest. High priest and chief priest are the same thing. When you say high priest, you are talking about the number one priest. In other words, there are several priests. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood. So in that royal priesthood, we have a high priest. We have a chief priest. And that chief priest is in the person of Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. That number one priest is in the person of Jesus Christ. So in this portion of the book of Hebrews, he was actually talking about Jesus Christ. And that's why he began by saying every high priest. Remember that in the Old Testament, they did have high priests. They had a high priest, as it were. And we also saw people like Melchizedek as well in the Old Testament. But here it says every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Now, this is not just for the high priest, but it's for every priest. The reason why he's saying every high priest here is because he's talking about the high priest, Jesus Christ. Every priest is expected to offer both gifts and sacrifices to God. And so when you and I come together as a people before God, we are expected to come with sacrifices and gifts. Praise the name of the Lord. And the Bible says it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. So we are not meant to appear before God empty-handed. Praise the name of the Lord. We are meant to come to the presence of God with gifts and sacrifices to offer. Praise the Lord. This is the reason why we give offerings in church. You know, we, give, we come to church with, you know, material gifts, possessions, and things like that to offer. But then that is not the only thing that is limited to. Amen. And there are believers who feel that these things are not important. And so many people speak against a lot of these things. But the truth of the matter is that the Bible tells us that it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. So we are all meant to have something to offer. Praise the name of the Lord. And um, when we come to church, there are some people who feel that the offering is something that is not necessary. No, my message is not really about the offering, but let me just start from this point. Some people feel that it's not necessary, especially when you look at maybe your financial situation, and then you feel like, ah, I don't really have so much, and so you don't plan to give. It's a big mistake. Because the offerings that we give are actually part of our worship to God as priests. They are part of the gifts and the sacrifices that we're meant to bring. And I realize that God is a God who keeps records. When you look at the book of Numbers, you find out that the, the, the leaders of the tribes of Israel were to give offerings to God. And one strange thing I found was that God itemized every single thing that each leader gave. And then the interesting thing was that there was no difference between what they all give. Now, the Bible is a book that doesn't waste space. Everything you find in the Bible is important. And so for God to carefully itemize each thing that the leaders of Israel offered, it tells us that he's interested in what we offer. Again, we find Jesus in the New Testament standing at the temple treasury and watching to see what people were giving. The Bible says the rich came, they cast. Then one poor widow came and she put in her might. And Jesus called them. He said, look, this woman actually gave more than everybody else, even though she was poor. The other thing I found out was that in the New Testament, as far as giving is concerned, the Bible will never use a rich man as an example. It uses poor people as an example. The examples from giving are always from poor people. He said, this widow you see, she has given more than them all. Paul, when he was writing, he talked about the Macedonians. Out of their poverty, they, deep poverty, they give. So when somebody is not too well to do financially, 
you know, that's even by sight. If you understand what I'm talking about. Because that is not really the fact. That's not really the truth, rather. It may be fact. When somebody doesn't have so much, there's that temptation not to give. It's a mistake. Every high priest has to come with offerings and sacrifices to give. Praise the name of the Lord. But then the Bible also tells us about spiritual sacrifices of praise, of thanksgiving, and of worship, which are meant for us to offer to God every time we come before his presence. And so these sacrifices of thanksgiving, of praise, and of worship are so important. And, you know, many times we use them interchangeably, even though they are very distinct. But you see, as much as the presence of God is so valuable, we must realize that the only things that can take us into the presence of God are offering the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. Outside of that, there's nothing that will take you into his, into his tangible and manifest presence. So this is the importance of having that culture, that discipline of Offering to God the sacrifice of praise and offering to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. As we just read, every priest is meant to offer sacrifices and gifts to God. So we must never be without thanksgiving before God. We must never be without praise before God. Now, our thanksgiving primarily, you know, relates to God's goodness. When we look at God and we see how good he has been to us, we give thanks and our praise also relates to his greatness. Praise is actually the response to a, a king who sits upon the throne. The Bible tells us in Psalm 22, and I think verse 3, it said, um, Thou art king who are enthroned on the praises of your people. So praise is actually the way we relate to God as priests. But then again, you know, in many portions of the scriptures, the Bible will show us this is how you enter into the presence of God. And the presence of God is so valuable. When I talk about the presence of God, I'm talking about that tangible presence, that manifest presence. The Bible tells us in that presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. In that presence, you hear the voice of God. In that presence, you are assured, you, you know, all confusion disappears. All darkness disappears. In that presence, if there were something that you were not settled about, you will find peace. And so this presence is so valuable to us. And I want us to appreciate this morning, if you don't remember anything I said, just remember that thanksgiving and praise takes you into that presence. And we use these three things interchangeably. Sometimes we praise, we say thanks, we give thanks, we say praise, or whatever, even though they are distinct. But you see, they are very much like the colors of the rainbow. You know, the colors of the rainbow are very distinct, but they blend into each other, and you can hardly find any absolute line of separation. So when you look at the rainbow, you can't tell that this is actually where red stops and where the next color starts. They just seem to blend so perfectly. And this is the way thanksgiving, praise, and worship tend to blend. But you see, thanksgiving and praise are primarily utterances, but worship is primarily an attitude, as it were. So we begin by, it says, let us come before God and let us offer the fruit of our lips. It's important that we, we don't live life carelessly. It's important that we see what God is doing every now and again. Thanksgiving and praise is access into the throne of God, access into the presence of God. Now in Psalm 100, a very popular, popular um, portion of the psalm, in verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness endures through all generations. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So it gives us two degrees of access. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Now let me ask you a question. 
When you enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, as it were, what happens next? What happens next is actually worship, which is a response to the holiness of God. Now, when we talk about various attributes of God, many times it's difficult for people to understand holiness because there's really no par parallel on earth. When we talk about the wisdom of God, we can relate with a wise man that we know. When we talk about the power of God, we can relate with powerful men on the face of the earth. There have been kings who have come and gone and stuff like that. But when we talk about the holiness of God, there's really no parallel on the face of the earth apart from God and those whom he has granted that holiness to. You know, so holiness, the holiness of God is actually all-encompassing. The holiness of God, you know, embraces all of the attributes of God. It embraces everything about God. The fact that God is love, God is light, you know, God is judgment, God is anger, you know, God is a whole lot of all of these things. And so when you come into such an encounter with the holiness of God, the only thing that will happen next is that you worship. And so worship is something that comes by revelation, you know, as it were. The psalmist says we should enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Praise the name of the Lord. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. There's a parallel of this same uh, scripture in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 60 or thereabouts, when it talked about um, the walls being salvation and the gates being praise. The same thing. The same thing. You know, so praise and thanksgiving are so crucial to the experience of the manifest presence of God. And the manifest presence of God should be a desire for every one of us who is a genuine child of God. Praise the Lord. So Psalm 22 and verse 3 says, God is exalted and he inhabits the praises of his people. So that's the way we respond to God, you know, in the place of praise. We respond to God as a king in the place of praise. Now when we look at praise, praise is something that has been eternal. From eternity... Praise has always been. In heaven, we find praise. Even when the earth began, we found praise. So God was asking Job, he said, were you there when I set the foundations of the earth in course? When the sons of God and the stars of heaven sang joyfully. So the earth actually began its course in the celestial realm with praise. And so every one of us that is currently on the face of the earth must ensure that the earth continues until it ends in the place of praise. Because one day this earth is also going to end. So praise is so crucial, so important, you know, to the Lord. And we must realize that this is actually our access, you know, to the presence of God. Praise the name of the Lord. Now thanksgiving as well, of course, coupled with praise, will take you into the presence of God. But then I want to show us some things about, um, about Thanksgiving um, this morning. And I want us to take a look at still Hebrews chapter 12. And um, let's look at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. It says, therefore, I'm reading, I think this is the NIV. Yeah, I'm reading the NIV. It says, therefore... Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Let me read the same thing to you in the New King James. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Now the New King James says, let us have grace by which we may serve God. And the NIV says, let us be thankful by which we may serve God. Now the two translations are actually correct. Because in the original, there's a direct connection between grace and thankfulness. 
you know, when you think back, even when we want to pray over our meals, what do we say? Normally we say, let us share the grace. So it tells us something that an unthankful person will always be outside of the grace of God. An unthankful person will always be outside of the grace of God. But a thankful person will find grace. So let us have grace. Let us be thankful. And even in languages, we find that this original connection still exists. Like some of the, um, the top romantic languages in the world today, like French, Spanish, you find those relationships there. You know, for, for example, if I want to say thank you in Spanish, what do I say? Gracias. That is from Greece. I was desperate for Jesus. I wanted him so badly. I wanted to share an intimate relationship with him. But I was lost. I kept going round in circles. And these activities I found myself in were just taking me farther away from Christ. But then I found TBR. I struck gold. I was so excited. Finally, a place where I can learn Christ. A place where I can be intimate with God. Are you tired of church as usual? Are you tired of being buried in activities? Then you need to come to TBR to experience what I'm experiencing. 